I am grateful that though things are uh, in somewhat of a mess in the United States right now, I am still grateful that I live in this country and am blessed for the worship, for the freedoms that we have. So we are going to begin our service this morning by singing the national anthem. So I'd invite you to stand as we share that together. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous high. For the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Do just want to remind you that our young people are away at summer retreat. They are doing well, having a great time. They are having an awesome time in God's Word. Um, as you can tell, they took most of our praise team with them, but that's okay because we are grateful that they are able to share and lead our young people in worship today and uh, over the weekend for their retreat. They will be returning home tomorrow late afternoon, so be in prayer for them while they are away. We will continue to do our best to keep you up to date on activities, whether they are scheduled, dropped, added, deleted. Um, as county regulations change, um, grateful so far that um, none of our church family, to our knowledge, um, has gotten the COVID virus, so we are grateful about that but we will do our best to keep you updated um, as things change. At this point, we are not planning to begin our Sunday school or Sunday night Bible studies um, till at least August, but again, that could change on a weekly basis, so keep your eyes and ears open. And of course, be in prayer for our young people as they are off on retreat this weekend. All right, if you didn't get one of our handouts from today, they are available on the table in the back. Also remember, during the time we are gathering here in the Family Life Center and doing our best to social distance and protect one another, we are not passing the offering plate on Sunday morning, but they are on tables in the back, and uh, so you can just drop that off there as uh, you come or go during the service today. Amen. As you're going back to your places, you may be seated this morning. <clears throat> we have a number of folks in our church congregation that are not here because they are sick uh, as well, allergy problems and other things. Um, before we have a word of prayer, I just want to share a couple of special prayer requests with you this morning. Some of you know that Chuck Jones' mother passed away. We had her funeral service this past week, so remember that family. Also, if you did not know, Lucy Cook passed away this past week, so remember her family as well. And Kelly Duggar has an aunt um, who had a 
major brain aneurysm last night and is not expected to live much longer, so we want to remember them in prayer as well. Would you join me as we ask the Lord's blessing on our service today? Father, we're grateful that we get to come and worship together today. And we know that is possible because of the people who have sacrificed through the generations to give us the freedoms that we enjoy in America. And we know, Lord, that our country's in a mess. But Father, we also know that your word tells us that if we as believers, if we would humble ourselves, if we would repent and we would turn to you, that you can heal our land. And Father, I pray for our nation. I pray for our leadership from the national level all the way down to the local level. I pray, Father, somehow, some way, they would look to you for their strength and especially for their wisdom and their guidance. Lord, I do want to lift up the Jones family. Lord, I just pray your hand of peace and comfort around them. Lord, for Lucy Cook's family as well, Lord, just bring them that peace that passes all understanding. And Lord, for Kelly's aunt, Lord, I just pray for your, your will to be done there. Lord, thank you that she knows you and is ready to go home, Lord, and I just pray for that family uh, in this time as well. But as we gather together today, we want to worship you. Lord, that's why we've gathered. And Lord, we know that there's a large group of our folks who are away on summer retreat with our young people, and I pray that as they worship this morning, that you do a work in their hearts and lives as they gather tonight to worship, as they travel home tomorrow. God, we're looking forward to you doing great things in their lives this weekend. Watch over them, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your presence in this place today. And Lord, I pray that you will be pleased with our worship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Y'all join me as we sing My Country Tis of Thee. My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. Of thee I sing, land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountain side let freedom bring. My native country, the land of the noble free, thy I love thy rock. 
for our nation, grateful to be a citizen of it, even more grateful that I'm a citizen of heaven. I invite you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of Psalm chapter 16. Psalm chapter 16, we're going to be looking at verse number one today. Psalm chapter 16 and verse number one. Our message is entitled, Will we leave a godly heritage? Will we leave a godly heritage? If you're not real familiar with God's Word, you'll find the book of Psalms just about in the middle of the Bible. Chapter 16 and verse number 1. And when you find that verse in your copy of God's Word or are able to look on with somebody this morning, I would invite you out of reverence to God's word to bow your head with me this morning. I'd also invite you to bow your heart before God and take the next few moments of quiet meditation and invite God to speak to your heart this morning. Take a few moments in quiet prayer time, then I'll lead us in a word of prayer and read our text. Father, I am grateful that I was born in this nation and enjoy the freedom to be able to come and worship together here. I am grateful that I was born again into your kingdom and am a citizen of heaven. I'm greatly grateful for the family of believers that I get to gather with this morning. I'm grateful for the family of yours that I belong to this morning. And as we open your precious word this morning, Lord, I pray that we will not hear from me, but we will hear from you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Psalm chapter 16 and verse 1, the Bible says, Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. If you ever have the opportunity or have had the opportunity to travel to Washington, D.C. and to tour some of the sites there. Many years ago, while I was in early times of college, I had the opportunity to visit Washington, D.C. and was <clears throat> privileged that one of the folks that helped to lead our tour guide was a family friend who was involved in with security and things there. So 
we got a little bit different of a tour than most folks get to have. I share this verse with you this morning because this verse has a special meaning to me when I think about our nation. If you ever have an opportunity to visit the Capitol building, off of the rotunda is a room called the prayer room. In that room, there is a focal point of a stained glass window in that prayer room off the rotunda. That stained glass is depicted of a picture of George Washington kneeling in prayer. And etched around that is this verse, Psalm 16, 1, Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. What a special thing. Alexander Graham Bell invented many things, many honors bestowed upon him. He's one of those folks that actually prepared his own epitaph and the design for his grave marker. He says this and had this done for his grave marker. Born Edinburgh, March 3rd, 1847, died, and then, of course, when he designed it, left that spot blank, and this is what he wanted on his tombstone, citizen of the United States of America. Of all the honors that had been bestowed upon him in his life, even for all of the inventions that were so uh, incredibly important in our country, the one thing he wanted to be remembered by was that he had become a citizen of the United States. And I want to talk to you a little bit about our nation this morning. I want to share just two principles with you. One, I want you to see, for us to see, that I believe our nation was established on godly principles. And I believe now more than ever our nation is dependent upon godly people. Our nation was established on godly principles. We sang the song this morning, My Country, Tis of Thee. If you didn't know, that particular song was written by a minister, actually a Baptist minister who wrote, My Country, Tis of Thee. You may not know, but when you stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, that was also written by a, happened to be, Baptist minister in 1892. In 1861, Reverend W.R. Wilkerson sent a letter to then federal judge S.P. Chase asking that in God we trust be put on our coinage and our currency. Seven days later, James Pollock, who was then the director of the U.S. Met, declared this nationally. No nation can be strong except in the strength of God or safe except in his defense. The trust of our people in God should be declared on all of our national currency. 1861. Long before that, Daniel Webster said, our ancestors established their system of government on and morality on moral principles and religious sentiment. Benjamin Franklin said, as he stood before the constituents who were working on an official document to govern our United States by you, the document that you and I call the Declaration of Independence. Here's the quote. In the beginning of the contest with Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had prayers daily in this room for divine protection. Have we now forgotten this powerful friend? Or do imagine we no longer need his assistance? Sir, I have lived a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of man. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, 
they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this. And then he closed with, I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth, imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessing on our deliberation be held in this assembly every morning. That was to the men who gathered there to write the document that would govern our nation. Wow. I was talking with somebody this past week, um, having a great conversation with a fellow conservative, then having a great debate with a friend who is very liberal. And I made the comment to the friend who is very liberal that it is sad that in our education system in the United States today, we have rewritten history and we have left out the documents, not tens of them, not hundreds of them, but thousands of documents in our nation's founding that declared we were built on Judeo-Christian principles. And that person said, they're not in our history book. And I said, you're right, they're not in our history book but I challenge you to look at those documents, and I'd be glad to send you as many as you want to read. They are everywhere. And that person said, give me an example then. And I said, I'll give you 13. The original colonies, when they drafted their charters to become states, get your book or Google it, and check out the original state charter. Just start with those. You can go through all 50 of them, but I'm just gonna ask you to go through 13 of them and read those original state charters and then call me back and tell me there's no mention of God or morality or Christian principles or the Bible or any such thing. I said, read every one of them and you will find and I said, let me just say before you read them, the language is not muddled. It's not indirect. It doesn't allude or refer to something. It states specifically. And I said, I'll do part of your homework. I said, let me give you just a little bit from the Rhode Island Charter because I was working on the sermon for this morning. Now, if you know anything about our nation today, you'll know that Rhode Island's not really considered a very conservative state. However, let me read you part of their original state charter, just for the argument to say that at least when our nation was founded, it was founded on Judeo-Christian principles unapologetically, and they're not in textbooks anymore. Here's Rhode Island state charter. We submit our persons, lives, and estates to our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, but they, it didn't say to some sovereign being out there. This is the original state charter. To our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. I could see the look on the person's face on the other end, thinking I was making it up. And to all the perfect and most absolute laws of his given to us in his holy word. That's not an allusion to something you could vaguely say was religious. The language is absolutely clear. And I said that's every single state charter. Now I'm not telling you they believe that anymore. I'm just telling you that that's how it was when our nation was founded. Check it out. I love what Noah Webster said. The religion which has introduced civil liberty. By the way, many of those folks will say, well, yeah, they, they did speak about religion. Just no specific religion. Let me just tell you what Noah Webster said. The religion which has introduced civil liberty is the religion of Jesus Christ and the, his apostles. Um, that's not an allusion to something that could be sought. 
And listen, to this we owe our free constitution of government. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other documents that show our nation was founded on those godly principles. Now, I'm not going to tell you that every one of them believed all the same doctrines that we do. But I am going to tell you that they founded our nation upon biblical principles, on Judeo-Christian principles. There is no question about that, even though secular historians today do their best to rewrite all of it and to try to interpret it in a different way. But if you do your homework, you'll learn that first point is very clear. We were established on godly principles. But I believe now, maybe more than any other time in the history of our country, we are dependent upon godly people. It is time for godly people to stand up. The book of Deuteronomy speaks very much about it. Moses and the Israelites have come to the promised land. They are about to usher into a new time for them. The Israelites are going to cross the Jordan. They're going to go in, take possession of the promised land, and live there. And Moses gives a series of messages to them before they go into the promised land. And the crux of it is this. When you get there, there is going to be a tendency for you to rest on your laurels. There's going to be a tendency for you to follow other gods. There's going to be a tendency for you to drift away from God. Don't do it. And he repeats it often in the book and says, remember, the nation that follows and obeys God and is dependent on God, God will bless, and the one that doesn't, God will curse. Simple as it can be. About 150 years ago, Abraham Lincoln said this, We have forgotten the gracious hand which has preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. When you see what's going on in our nation today, it's hard to believe that that was said 150 years ago. Listen to that last part that we've come to a place where we thought all those blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. He could be saying that today, couldn't he? And 150 years ago he was saying that. I want you to know it's possible to be, it's possible to be an American and take no responsibility for being one. It's going on all around us. People who call themselves Americans, who take no responsibility to be a productive citizen. But I want you to know, you may call yourself an American, but you are neither patriotic, nor a good, nor a godly citizen if you do. You and I have to know. You see, you can go to church and not be a Christian, did you know that? You can go to Baptist church all your life and never be a Christian. I like to put this way, I heard a long time ago, you can stand in a garage, you'll never be a car. You can go to church and never be a Christian. You can be a Baptist and never go to heaven. Isn't that something? You can be a Baptist and never go to heaven. You can be a member of the church, but not be a member of God's church kingdom this past week I conducted a funeral service it was unique in in a number of ways but I'd like to share one with you this morning we were over on the other side of the county in Jonesville and this was for Chuck Jones mother's funeral service and after we had the funeral service at the funeral home, we went out to the cemetery uh, there across the street from Jonesville Baptist Church to have the graveside part of it. It's an interesting little story on Chuck's parents. Many years ago, Chuck's mother, then a teenager, was going to 
Jonesville Baptist Church. And sometimes when the church service was over, some of those young people would walk across the street and just kind of walk through the cemetery as just a nice, pretty place to kind of walk through and read some of the different tombstones. And one of the nights after church was over that she was walking through there, there was a new guy there. Their eyes met. Both he and she would say later that the moment our eyes met in that cemetery, we were both in love. It was love at first sight for both of them. They would marry, become Mr. and Mrs. Jones, Chuck's mom and dad. Now, I don't share that with you just because it's a neat little story how they met in a cemetery. And I shared there to say, isn't it something that in this very place where we are right now, his parents met for the first time. They could never have imagined what life would bring for the two of them that they would raise five children and one day he would die and the next year she would die and the two of them would be laid to rest next to each other in the very same place they had met. And I used that as an illustration to say, folks, remember, we have no idea what's coming. I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. They could never have imagined what life was going to bring for them and that they'd end up being buried right there in that place together where they first met and able to share the most incredible truth that none of us have an idea what's coming tomorrow. Kelly shared with me about her aunt. 87, did you say she was? 87 years old, out playing outside with the kids yesterday had dinner last night, having a great time. Dinner was over. She said, I don't feel good. And just like that, major brain aneurysm. I have no idea what tomorrow is going to bring. I can plan for it, but none of us know. We don't know, even know that we have a promise of another day. That's why when I began the sermon, I shared that I'm grateful to be a citizen of the United States. I'm more grateful that I'm a citizen of heaven. Because I know that one day when my life ends or Jesus Christ comes back, I know that when I stand before God, exactly what God's going to say to me. He is going to welcome me home as one of his children. Because I'm a pastor? Nope. Because I go to church? Nope. Because I hope that in my life I've done more good things than I've done bad things? Nope. And I'm not saying I didn't do more good things than bad things. But even if I hadn't, or had, that's not going to get me to heaven. Because this book was written with one focal point, and that was Jesus Christ, who would come, die on a cross, just like Rhett sang, die on a cross on a hill to pay my penalty for my sin so that I could have a home in heaven for all of eternity. I didn't deserve it. I was a sinner. None of the ways that I grew up thinking I might make it, I found out from the Bible, none of them will get me there. The only way is to put my faith and trust in Christ. Tell God I'm sorry for my sin and give me my life. And that's an individual decision for everybody. If you're willing to simply say, God, I am sorry for all my sin, everything I've done, I confess it to you, Lord. And I put my faith and trust in your son, Jesus Christ, who came for me in my place. And I give you my life. If you're willing to do that, the Bible says that God will forgive all your sin, cleanse your heart, adopt you as his child. It is, without a doubt, the greatest decision I ever made in my life. And that's an individual decision for you. And if you're not sure what God's going to say to you, if you don't know for sure you're going to enter heaven, you can. In a few minutes, we're going to invite folks to come and pray at the front of our church. If you're not sure about your relationship with God, if you don't know that you're going to spend eternity in heaven, we'd like to take a few minutes before you go, sit down with you, 
and just share from God's word how you can know that your sins are forgiven, all of them, and that you're a child of God headed for heaven. Wow, awesome. We'd love to share that with you. We're going to have an invitation in a few minutes, and we'll invite you to come. I'll be standing right down here. Just let us know. We've got a godly heritage to pass on. I believe with all of my heart that God blessed us with this godly nation, and I believe with all of my heart that God has given the responsibility of preserving and keeping it to his children. And we have a responsibility to preserve it and to pass it on. We must always remember how bitterly our freedom was won. We must always remember what that freedom has cost. Wow. And by the way, let me just say something about freedom in light of what's going on in our nation today. Let me be very clear about this. Freedom is not the right to do as we please, but the opportunity to do what is right. Freedom is not the opportunity to do whatever we please. It is the opportunity to do what is right. And I pray that as we prepare to go today that we will make a determination that our faith will be something that's not simply stamped on our coins, but a faith that's expressed in how we live our lives before God and others. About three weeks ago, I did a funeral service for a longtime family friend. He had had an incredible career in the Marines. Two Marine staff sergeants there to fold the flag that was draped on his casket. Anytime I do a service that involves the military, I am always deeply, deeply honored. And to watch those two staff sergeants fold that flag, play taps, and then present that flag to the family is always one of the most touching things I experience. If you've been to one, you know what I'm talking about. But here's one little observation you might not have known. Those flags are folded and they're presented to a family member, not buried with the deceased generally. If you know about that, you know that the way they fold that flag, all of it has significance and meaning. Even the very presentation of that flag to a family member or whoever that day in itself is a great symbol, a meaningful symbol, a designated and designed symbol that tells us that flag's not buried with the deceased because even though the person has died, the nation that they died for still goes on. In itself, is a symbol. And when you stand there and you observe that and you realize that this is a person who served all those years, it's now passed away, and that flag was given as a symbol that the nation goes on. And that's the point that I want us to see today. That you and I, as God's children, have a responsibility to not only preserve, but to carry on that freedom. And that freedom costs. It is a responsibility that should come with sacrifice. I know that most everybody here, probably everybody here today, would say, I value freedom greatly. But whether we really value something isn't determined by what's in our heart. 
but by the sacrifice we're willing to make for it. And I would ask each person here today that we make that commitment to say, I am willing to sacrifice, to preserve that freedom and liberty that God has given to us. And so in a minute, as we invite folks to come and pray, I'd invite you this morning just between you and God to come to the front and say, God, I'm just going to come and pray for this nation today, that God, you do a healing in our nation, that God, you'll give leadership wisdom. But I don't want you to stop there. Because those are great prayers, and I believe we should be praying them every day. But to also be able to say, and God, I commit the way I live before you and others in preserving that liberty and those freedoms. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me this morning? Heads bowed. Are you free from your sin? Do you know that you're going to spend eternity in heaven? You can. If you're willing to give the Lord your life, confess your sin and trust Christ, God will forgive you, adopt you. You'll have a home in heaven and a new life as God's child. If you're not sure about that or you'd like to make that decision today or you'd like to know more about it, in a moment when we have prayer, I'd invite you to just come to the front. I'll be standing right here. We'll sit down, somebody will, and take a few minutes to talk to you about that decision. To my brother, sister in Christ, I invite you to come this morning and say, God, I'm not coming just to pray for healing. I'm not coming just to pray for wisdom. But I'm coming to say, God, I'm willing, I'm willing to sacrifice for that freedom and liberty. Father, bless our invitation time. May we be willing to be obedient. In Jesus' name we pray. I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed this morning as our instrumentalist begins to play. Our invitation's open, and I invite you to come this morning. Come on.